arrested in the UK and wanted in the US. The WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange faces an uncertain future after he was kicked out of the Ecuadorian embassy in London. But will he be extradited? What about the allegations of sexual assault and hacking? And is this all about freedom of speech or a man hiding from the charges against him? This is Inside Story. Hello, I'm Kamal Santa Maria. For 2,487 days, he was right there, within touching distance of the British police, but in the end, always untouchable. We are, of course, talking about Julian Assange, the founder of the whistleblowing website WikiLeaks, who, for nearly seven years, was an unintended guest of the Ecuadorian embassy in London as he tried to avoid both angry governments and accusations of sexual assault. Well, on Thursday, that all changed as Ecuador revoked his political asylum and then allowed police into the embassy where he was arrested on the spot. It is a complicated story because there are many allegations across multiple countries, some of which have been dropped, but on technicalities. This first arrest, dramatically played out in front of the media, was for breaching bail. It could mean 12 months in prison. But then later, Assange was arrested again at the request of the United States, which wants him extradited. And then there are the sexual assault allegations. Swedish prosecutors dropped a rape investigation into Assange in 2017, saying as long as he was in the embassy, they couldn't formally notify him of the accusation. And a second woman's claim of molestation was halted in 2015 due to time limits. What you're seeing here are the letters from more than 70 British MPs who've written to the Home Secretary saying the sexual assault allegations should not be forgotten and that Assange should be extradited to Sweden first if requested. Assange's supporters, though, say his arrest is an attack on freedom of speech and that he's being punished for exposing war crimes. This is a dark day for, for journalism, as, as Jennifer said, this sets a, a precedent. Uh, we don't want uh, this to go forward. This has to, has to uh, be uh, averted. The UK government needs to make a full assurance that a journalist will never be extradited to the United States for publishing activity. This pertains to publishing work nine years ago, publishing of documents, of videos, of killing of innocent civilians, exposure of war crimes. This is journalism. So you can see there are a lot of angles to the Julian Assange story and they need some clarity. So here we go. Assange first sought refuge in that embassy in London to avoid extradition to Sweden over those two separate sexual assault allegations, which he does deny. Both those investigations were dropped after prosecutors ran out of time to question him. But now Swedish prosecutors say they are re-examining one of those cases. His seven years in the Ecuadorian embassy ended over what was called, quote, discourteous and aggressive behaviour and concerns that he was interfering in the country's affairs. And then, as we mentioned, Assange faces extradition to the United States on charges of conspiring to hack into a government computer, uh, along with the former army intelligence analyst Chelsea Manning. That dates back to 2010. And there are also the Democratic Party emails published by WikiLeaks in 2016 during the US election campaign, uh, which have raised some questions over Assange's links, perhaps, to Russia. Lots to talk about, and we've got a great panel to do that with, starting in London with Michael Patchett Joyce. Uh, he is a barrister in international and European law. In Philadelphia, Clea Finkelstein, who is a professor of law at the University of Pennsylvania Law School. And rounding out our panel in Norfolk in the UK, Vaughan Smith, who is a freelance journalist and a personal friend of Julian Assange. So able to give us uh, some interesting insight there. In fact, Vaughan, why don't I start with you? Um, even as a, a, a supporter, and I suspect Mr Assange knew this as well, this day had to come, didn't it? The Ecuadorians, after nearly seven years, were probably going to run out of, I guess, patience might be the word at some stage. Well, I, I, it, this came because there was a change of um, political administration in uh, Ecuador. Uh, there was a new president um, who had different policies. Um, the previous one um, had attempted to get Julian to Ecuador, but um, the, we... we we didn't, as a country, the British didn't allow, allow Julian to leave the embassy. So were you in touch, or how much were you in touch with, with Mr Assange leading up to this? 
Um, Friday before last, so eight days ago, um, I had um, booked, because you have to book, to go and visit him. Um, and so I saw him about an hour and a half. Now, he, he'd been expected to be kicked out. He was expecting it uh, but from before Christmas, that any day he would be kicked out. And I think he was planning to walk out. Um, I was quite upset, I must say, to see the way he was dragged out, because I feel that was done really for the television cameras to promote the idea that he was a, a sort of fugitive of sorts. So I, I was quite disappointed that um, he, he wasn't able to have a bit more dignity there. The point I would make, just before I go to our other guests, uh, is that he made that choice to go into that embassy nearly seven years ago, didn't he? I know there's been a lot of talk, he sort of almost felt like he was under house arrest and that he couldn't move and couldn't go out, but he made that decision knowing what could happen, maybe not knowing he'd be in there for seven years, but certainly knowing what the consequences could be. Well, yes, I mean, he claimed, uh, he claimed asylum. He was given diplomatic asylum. Um, and that has been revoked, which I understand is uh, against international law. And I understand it was tested in the Inter-American Court of Human Rights quite recently by Assange's lawyers who found it in his favour. Uh, and also, I think it's important to observe that Julian has won on all the sort of supranational bodies that are available to him. Um, for example, the U United Nations Working Group for Arbitrary Detention did determine that he was detained. And I understand that is the, the highest authority to decide such a thing. But, but, but unfortunately, or fortunately, but whatever, I mean, mm. these, are, these judgments aren't, um, you, you, you know, Britain and America and, and Ecuador aren't, don't have to uh, apply those judgments. And their advisory is my understanding. But nevertheless, um, you know, if the highest authority in the world determines he's arbitrarily detained and he, de detained and he deserved asylum, then that, that is fine. The other thing I think is very important to point out, um, uh, because uh, I think there's a, a corrective needed, um, he claimed asylum to avoid being extradited to um, uh, America, which is the thing that appears to be happening now. Mm. Um, and he's been very consistent about that. And he said that he feared and he, he knew there was a, an extradition. Journalists at the time, almost all of them, thought that wasn't happening. And now it is. Um, though, so, you know, the, the, the Swedish thing, he said that he would be happy to go to Sweden to face those charges. He wants, uh, you know, his day in court, just as the women deserve it too. And I think it's very important, very interesting that, the, that this letter has gone round, which I hugely support. I think it's really good. That, that he does go to, to, to uh, Sweden, but it mustn't be misunderstood. He said that he would go to Sweden if there could be guarantees that he wasn't going to be extradited to the United States. That's what he's trying to avoid. OK, I'll come back to you shortly, uh, Vaughan. Let's go to Michael Patch at Joyce now in London for some, uh, I was going to say legal advice, legal perspective, let's put it that way. He was arrested. We, we, we've outlined there with Vaughan the, the, the different issues which uh, Mr Assange has faced. In the end, he was arrested for skipping bail. Uh, 12 months in a UK prison is the likely situation. Do you see that, how it, how it plays out? Because there is this pressure to extradite well, that's him. that's the maximum. OK. That's the maximum penalty that he could get. What has happened is that he was tried in Westminster Magistrates Court on Thursday, convicted of the charge of uh, breaching his bail, of not answering to his bail back in 2012. Uh, and the Magistrates Court has now remitted the case to the Crown Court, Southwark Crown Court, which will determine the sentence at a date to be fixed. Now, 12 months is the maximum. Uh, there is a judicial discretion as to where the precise uh, term of imprisonment, if that is imposed, uh, rests. But will It'll be a shorter period of time. OK. Will, do you think, and I know there's a lot of speculation involved in everything we talk about today, but do you think the United States will be putting the pressure on and saying, actually, we want him now, we want him sooner rather than later? No, I think that there is a due process in relation to extradition, uh, and it's quite clear that due process will have to be followed. I don't think there's any means of short-circuiting this. Uh, that would be an infringement of the process of law, the rule of law. Uh, I, I think it's probably going to be rather protracted proceedings. And what about the issue, Michael, of Sweden? Uh, Vaughan's already brought that up there. The... Just explain again to our viewers what's happened. As I understand, time basically ran out. Can these charges, allegations come back? I believe the Swedes are already talking about possibly reinvestigating. Well, there was a series of charges, uh, or at least allegations, that he was facing in Sweden. Uh, and they ranged, they were, they were all serious, but they ranged from molestation and coercion to allegations of rape. Now, as I understand it under Swedish law, and you have to understand I'm an English law specialist rather than a Swedish law specialist, um, so I can't speak with total authority, but it's my understanding that within that range of allegations, uh, 
some, the allegations in relation to molestation and coercion, had a statute of limitations, and therefore the time in relation to investigation of those has, as I understood it, uh, run out, and that really is the end of it. The more serious charges of rape, uh, I don't think there is a statute of limitations in Sweden, but um, there is an important distinction between raising allegations under Swedish law and charging someone. You have to have access, you have to charge in the presence of the accused. Now, obviously, whilst Mr Assange was in the Ecuadorian embassy, mm -hmm. that was impossible. So the, the investigation in relation to the rape allegations really ran into the sand and reached an impasse so that the Swedish authorities desisted from continuing. Now, I have no doubt that in Sweden there will be a big debate as to whether that desisting from continuing uh, means that it's simply gone into abeyance and now can be revived, or whether uh, having desisted, uh, then that's an end of the matter. That's a matter for Swedish law, uh, and I'm sure will be hotly debated and contested in the Swedish courts. OK, time to bring in Claire Finkelstein in uh, Philadelphia for the US perspective. I like what we're doing here, actually. We're just laying out all the facts without getting into the subjective stuff just yet. Claire, let's talk about the indictment which the US uh, has got. And I note that it is very carefully written. He has not been charged with publishing government secrets, which would be usually the big headline. He has been charged with, quote, committing unlawful computer intrusion. Explain this one to us, please. That's correct. So it's not quite espionage and it's not passively just receiving uh, stolen government documents and classified documents and, and disseminating them, which would be a problem if he is indeed to be considered a journalist because it would be protected activity under the First Amendment. It's something in between, which is basically computer hacking. And he's accused of doing this uh, as part of a conspiracy with uh, then Bradley Manning, now Chelsea Manning, uh, who clearly violated the law and she would be the principal and uh, of course he would be an accessory to that crime and uh, part of the conspiracy. So is this a way of going after him for something which is more likely to be successful? As you say there is or well, there are is a grey area over journalism, over freedom of speech, over these sorts of issues so go after him for the thing which quote unquote can be proven or can more easily be proven. It's turning out to be more controversial in the U.S. than you might have thought. So the ACLU and other journalistic organizations have come out strongly in his favor and said that they are very concerned about the precedent that it sets to, pros to prosecute him uh, because, in their view, he is a member of the press. And the big worry that First Amendment lawyers and activists have had is that members of the press will be uh, prosecuted for espionage or espionage-related offenses. Uh, in, in his case, however, there's a real question whether or not WikiLeaks should count as a press organization. Uh, there are many people who feel that in the wake of the role that WikiLeaks played in disseminating what appears to be Russian hacked information, mm. uh, illegally hacked information on the part of a foreign power, uh, that in, in a sense he forfeits his press status. Uh, if the sole reason for his existence at this point is to disseminate uh, information based on a playbook that Vladimir Putin has. That's a, a very controversial issue. Uh, then the, the second question would be, if he is nevertheless a legitimate press uh, organization, member of the press, uh, are the activities that he is accused of in the indictment that was unsealed uh, protected activities, and many people feel that even if he is a member of, of the press, these go beyond what the First Amendment was designed to protect journalists right. from, because it involves a level of activity and not just passive receipt of information and dissemination of that information. OK, Claire, I want to come back to you in a little while uh, to talk a little bit more about Russia. I think we are now into some really interesting stuff which Claire has brought up, and it's the, the, the more subjective stuff, and I'll go back to Vaughan on this one. Is Julian Assange a journalist? There are a lot of people out there who say he's not. They would say that actually WikiLeaks, it's a whistleblowing website, it's a, it's an, it's a conduit, it finds, the, it finds the details, and actually WikiLeaks has paired up with a number of established media organisations in the past to get that information out there. Yet, 
Mr Assange and his lawyers continually say this is about journalism? Yes, I, it's a very good point, I think. It's, it's quite a crucial one. Um, he's certainly a publisher, I would say. Um, and many other journalists re have recognised him as a journalist. I mean, he's won the Martha Gellhorn Prize. Index on Censorship gave him a prize for journalism. So it, it's quite a difficult one. Um, I, I think it, it clearly is debatable whether he's a journalist. I think he's a journalist. But if he's a publisher, I understand legally it's a, a similar sort of thing anyway. So it may be uh, slightly academic. Could I just go back to one thing, though? Sure. Um, this Swedish matter, I just want to... Can I just answer, go back? Or, uh, no, please uh, do. Uh, on, the, on the Swedish matter, the, our Crown Prosecution Service in Britain um, was found to have uh, email correspondence with the Swedish prosecutor um, where they were trying to dissuade her from coming to London and actually um, uh, interviewing Julian. Um, th there's something fishy going on, or has been. It does seem that um, politics have intruded somehow on this case, because if, if the prosecutors aren't actually prosecuting, then you have to uh, question what, what's really behind all this, um, to, to, to one level. Um, and uh, in a sense, this was revealed by um, uh, that La Republica did a Freedom of Information Act request in Sweden and got these emails. Those emails turned out to have been destroyed um, and deleted by our Crown Prosecution Service. So, you know, I don't think it's completely clear cut what's happened to Sweden, though I do think it's important that he does go to Sweden to clear his name. Michael, I know you said you weren't a, uh, an expert on, on Swedish law, but is there anything you can add to what Vaughan was saying there? No, I don't think there is very much to be added. We are in a rather odd position uh, in that um, through Vaughan, who has obviously been speaking directly to Mr Assange very recently, uh, we have the up-to-date information that Mr Assange would presumably willingly or possibly voluntarily go to Sweden. But at the moment, um, there are no charges because they can only be allegations until they're put to him in person. And the investigations have been uh, have uh, closed, certainly uh, temporarily. We don't know whether that's going to be reopened. Mm. The English press is reporting Mr Assange's Swedish lawyers as saying that they consider it highly unlikely that he would ever face um, prosecution in Sweden, perhaps because of the lapse of time, the fading of witnesses' memories, mm. uh, and considerations like that. Yeah, it is 10 years on, to be fair. Let's go back then to this issue of journalism, Absolutely. as we were discussing uh, before. Claire Finkelstein, I'll come back to you. You, you raised the point and, and, and the, the concerns that there are in the United States about this. Who will decide in the end? I mean... It's becoming an existential question. How do we decide if he is a journalist or not and therefore what will happen to him and how the charges will, will develop from here? Well, just uh, very briefly, if I may, to follow up on the <laughs> Swedish matter. Uh, <laughs> first of all, I'm rather puzzled by the suggestion that the Swedes would take the position that the statute of limitations had run, because usually when someone is a fugitive from justice, uh, the statute of limitations is told. At least that would be the principle in the U.S. Uh, I'm not an expert on Swedish law either, uh, but it's very strange that you can run out the clock on a charge by simply uh, evading those charges for long enough. Uh, I think it's very telling that I he himself very, would I, rather I clear, face but... what... Hmm? And, uh, I, I, think say, I think it is telling. clear that the coercion charges have been dropped, uh, and that was because of um, uh, expiry of limitation. It may be... I, I, I do agree with you, uh, Claire, that uh, it's surprising that a fugitive for justice can wait out uh, a, a period of limitation and then not face the music. But it does seem but that that is the case in under festival. Swedish criminal law. Go ahead, Claire. Very puzzling. Just, just yeah. The other issue about uh, Swedish... Uh, uh, yeah. Just hold on, Vaughan. We'll let Claire finish her thought and then I'll come to you. OK. The other issue about the Swedish uh, situation is that it's quite interesting to me that he would rather go back and face coercion charges or, or possibly a rape investigation in Sweden than face what appears to be a minor uh, computer hacking 
related charge. This, again, is not a charge of espionage. I think what he is expecting, I can only guess that what he is expecting is that there might be another indictment mm. coming along relating to the 2016 election hacking. Right. Uh, and that he'd be extremely concerned about facing that. Now, there's a, a tricky legal issue here relating to extradition uh, agreements, which is that although if he were already in the U.S., it would always be possible to add another charge uh, or to have a superseding indictment to the one that he has, uh, to have an additional indictments and so on, because mm. the 2016 hacking is completely unrelated to the um, Manning hack. Yeah. Uh, and, and I am still going to ask you uh, about that in a moment, Claire. Vaughan, just very quickly. I, I'm just worried that we're referring to the Swedish allegations as charges too often. I, I think that's quite an important thing. Mm. Um, now, my, my, having spoken to Julian, and I think this, this does add something, he's certainly of the mind that ad, charges would somehow be added and, I, and that actually this, is, this extradition is designed to get him to uh, America for life, uh, to a, an American jail. And, and also, uh, it's important to point, he, he said before he went, you know, as he went and claimed asylum in the Ecuadorian embassy, he, he said then that he would happily walk out at any time mm. to go to Sweden if there was a guarantee he wasn't sent to America. I, just to get that clear. OK, fair enough. Right. Um, I'm just going to make a note for next time as well that we will get a Swedish law expert on because that's what everyone wants to talk about at the moment. <laughs> Claire, I come back to you. Claire, can I come back to you on the issue of Russia? Because you've raised it a couple yeah. of times and we have mentioned it. The, the, the publishing of stolen uh, Democratic Party emails in the lead-up to the 2016 election, very much not part of this indictment, but it hovers over everything, doesn't it? And, and Donald Trump gets drawn into it as well when he previously said he loved WikiLeaks, and now he says, oh, I don't really care that much about them. This will linger, won't it? Uh, it absolutely will. I think the first thing to look at, and if I were his lawyer, I would be arguing uh, that extradition law itself would freeze these charges so that normally if you get extradited for a certain offense, uh, the agreement between the UK and the US around the charges that he's being extradited for would prevent the US government from adding additional charges. Uh, unlike if he were already in the US when any number of additional indictments could happen. Mm. If that is not the case, and it may be that US authorities will try to add either to this indictment or um, add a new indictment relating to the 2016 hacking before they put in an extradition request so that they're not barred from making that, uh, making those extra charges, uh, then things get very complicated. Uh, and there's a, a potential of a very strange alliance here uh, between the White House and folks like the ACLU who were saying he should be considered a journalist and so be protected under First Amendment grounds because he could be quite dangerous to President Trump given mm -hmm. what he may know if indeed there was a conspiracy uh, between him, Roger Stone, and the Trump campaign uh, to hack into and release uh, the emails uh, hacked from the DNC. Yeah. Uh, so it may be that uh, the White House is not very eager to see him extradited to the US either. Final thought then, just as we're running on the clock, we have spent the past 20 minutes or so talking about the man, Julian Assange. The fact is he founded a website called WikiLeaks. And I wonder, Vaughan, maybe I'll start with you, uh, regardless of what happens to him, and it could be a very drawn out process, WikiLeaks is still there, isn't it? And it will still keep doing what it does regardless. Yes, uh, Julian uh, stopped running WikiLeaks, uh, gosh, uh, nearly a year ago now. Uh, and he did that because he couldn't from, do it from the embassy anymore, the Ecuadorian embassy, because of the restrictions that were applied to him. So he's not running it. Um, and I'm not sure where it's based. It might be Iceland or somewhere. So in a sense, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, a, a, a whistle. It's it's sort of you know the gorilla uh, rather than anything else, and it operates on almost no money at all, um, and it's relatively easy to run, um, you know, compared with um, the forces that are arranged against it. Well, folks, the clock's beaten us, I'm afraid. I'd love to keep talking, especially about Swedish law, but we have run out of time. So I'd like to thank Michael Padgett-Joyce uh, in London, also Claire Finkelstein uh, in Philadelphia, and Vaughan Smith joining us from Norfolk. Thank you to all of you.
And thank you for watching. Remember, this program, indeed all our Inside Story episodes, are online for you to see again. You just head to aljazeera.com, look in the shows section for Inside Story. Also, have plenty of online discussion. We are at facebook.com slash AJ Inside Story. We're on Twitter at AJ Inside Story. I'm at Kamal AJE. Uh, if you want to tweet me directly, thanks for joining us for Inside Story. I'm Kamal Santamaria, and we will see you again soon.